evening, everybody. How are you? It is great to see you all, and I will say that I already um, know that being the opening uh, for Mike Johnston is, I, I told him a couple of weeks ago, I'm so glad I'm going first, um, and that you get, to, uh, you get to close. But I will also say in the short time <clears throat> that I've been in Illinois the last couple of hours, um, I will say this, you all are a hearty group. Um, <laughs> Illinois, folks from Illinois put uh, my former New Englanders to shame, and I will be sure to use examples of you all tra um, traipsing out in this weather to be here. Um, it's clearly a packed house, and I think it, it says a lot about your commitment um, to education, your commitment to the young people in the state of Illinois, um, and also your commitment to lead um, from where you sit. And so I bring, I bring you greetings, not only from the Education Trust, but uh, from our nation's capital. And it's so nice to be in friendlier um, political territory. I said, you know, you would never know these people disagree with one another because you're smiling and shaking one another's hands. Um, and I would much rather uh, be amongst you all than go back to DC any day. Um, but in terms of what we're here for um, this evening, <clears throat> I want to take a little bit of time, um, not much this evening, um, to really reground um, us and to connect you all and your work here in Illinois to a larger conversation, uh, larger work going on nationally um, in education and specifically how the work that we are all doing really connects to deeper issues of equity. And oftentimes in the cacophony of voices, um, we forget that actually what we're grounded in doing is, is really in moving the needle um, to, to the next level on where kids are achieving. And so what I'd like to do is start actually um, with some successes. And it's so easy when we're in our everyday life and, and we look at how far we have to go um, to not recognize that actually the work um, over the last decade or so has actually yielded um, some successes. And I think that that's important because often when we talk about getting down and, and dirty about what needs to happen next, right, and getting our, getting our hands dirty and really rolling up our sleeves, sometimes we don't take time to look at where we've come from. And, and the reality is that actually right now we do have more of our young people um, graduating high school and going to college. And if you look um, at our high school graduation rates, and there's been a lot of um, conversation and communication around this, they're definitely not where we want them to be. There are still gaps, particularly for um, black students and Latino students, um, but you'll see that we have experienced some success. And I know as a uh, former teacher, as a former district administrator, um, that if you can't even get kids to high school graduation, um, then you might as well even stop the conversation, right? Because it, that really is a minimum entry point, and we have begun making some progress on that. And if we look at our college going rates and some of the data um, that this slide is showing us, what we're seeing is that we actually are doing a better job at creating kind of what I call entry-level opportunities, right? So we actually do have um, increases in college going rates um, for all students, right? So this, is, this uh, graph is showing us the percentage of high school graduates that are immediately enrolling. And if you look at the differences between 1972 and 2012, it's not nearly where we want it to be, but we actually have seen an uptick. Right? And so part of this is because nationally we have been focused on, on these markers, right? High school graduation and getting kids to college. Um, but what's been really interesting <clears throat> about this work, and from I always revert back to my experience as a former middle school teacher, and I revert back to my current uh, living experience, and uh, Jim, Mike, and I got to bond as parents in the car ride up from Chicago, um, and also as a parent. And when I look at the landscape um, and see that we actually have made progress, one of the things that I have to ask myself, though, is while we have opened up opportunity, have we actually increased the actual skills, proficiency, and knowledge that our young people have? So we've done a good job in beginning to move the needle, 
But the educator in me knows that it's one thing to have a piece of paper. It's another thing for that piece of paper to actually translate right, into life changes that mean something for kids that means something for young people. And so in my last two months when I was chief academic officer in Baltimore City um, and I was addressing my principals for what I later realized would be the last time, um, one of the things that was interesting, I had a room about this size filled with primarily high school principals and we were going back and forth about how hard this work is and they were like, Sonia, look, I mean, just to get kids to graduation, like, my God, why are you like, why are you on my back about this? I mean, it's just hard enough to get them to graduation. And I said, absolutely, but I want you to hear through the voice of a young person why it has to be more than just that. And so what I'm going to do for you now is actually play for you um, what I played for them um, at this conference when they were asking me why we needed to care and why we needed to do more. And what is wonderful about being able to use this video here is because actually this is a young man who is a native um, from the fine state of Illinois um, in the city of Chicago. And this is a presentation um, that Malcolm did uh, at a TED Talk. And it was a TED Talk specifically in education. I have some people nodding, so that's always a good thing. That means you've previewed it for me already. Um, and when I played this, um, immediately after, I'll give you a little preview, the room was quiet. And I had one of my um, gnarliest high school principals call out at the end of this and said, we get it, Sonia. We get why we can't stop the work at these entry level successes. So I wanna just play this for you. At 7.45 a.m., I opened the doors to a building dedicated to building, yet only breaks me down. I march down hallways cleaned up after me every day by regular janitors, but I never had the decency to honor their names. Lockers left open like teenage boys' mouths when teenage girls wear clothes that covers the insecurities but exposes everything else. Masculinity mimicked by men who grew up with no fathers. Camouflage worn by bullies who are dangerously armed but need hugs. Teachers pay less than what it cost them to be here. Oceans of adolescents come here to receive lessons but never learn to swim. Part like the Red Sea when the bell rings. This is a training ground. My high school is Chicago, diverse, and segregated on purpose. Social lines are barbed wire. Labels like regulars and honors resonate. I am an honors, but go home with regular students who are soldiers in territory that owns them. This is a training ground to sort out the regulars from the honors, a reoccurring cycle built to recycle the trash of this system, trained at a young age to capitalize letters taught now that capitalism raises you, but you have to step on someone else to get there. This is a training ground where one group is taught to lead and the other is made to follow. No wonder so many of my people spit bars because the truth is hard to swallow. The need for degrees has left so many people frozen. Homework is stressful. But when you go home every day and your home is work, you don't want to pick up any assignments. Reading textbooks is stressful, but reading does not matter when you feel your story is already written, either dead or getting booked. Taking tests is stressful. But bubbling in a scantron does not stop bullets from bursting. I hear education systems are failing. But I believe they're succeeding at what they're built to do, to train you, to keep you on track, to track down an American dream that has failed so many of us all.
what I would argue is that our job is to actually provide the kinds of experiences that help our young people know that actually it is not just about getting them part of the way there, it's about getting them the full way there. It's not about settling for the initial successes. It really is about digging deeply. And I would argue that the next phase of whether you call it reform, improvement, whatever the localized version of momentum for improved education is, and reducing gaps, is tied to going deeper into what young people are actually learning and what they're experiencing. Now, I'm here to tell you that as an educator, I would be booed off the stage from, with anybody that I ever taught with or lived next to if I were to tell you that any standards, even the Illinois learning standards in and of themselves, are going to by themselves transform right, the kind of bifurcation that Malcolm references in his piece. I would also be disingenuous to tell you that an assessment in and of itself is going to rectify the bifurcation that Malcolm referenced. But I will also tell you this, that what we've seen is that without those two very important components, we don't have a real understanding of where our young people are and where it is they need to go. And so when we take that deeper look, what we see is that too many of our young people still aren't prepared for post-secondary education or work. And so one of the things with, um, within Ed Trust that we do is we have been following, like many, many of you and many others, we've been following the NAEP scores, right, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, because one of the things that the NAEP scores tell us is not just what kind of fundamental right, early learning kind of entry baseline, what I sometimes call basement entry door requirements are, they at least have given us a picture of what true proficiency, true skill, mastery actually looks like and the kind of skills that are going to give you access, even if, as Malcolm referenced, you're not in the quote honors track, but you are just going to school every day. And so what standards allow us to do is to be able to say we know that the floor we're using for everybody's kids is the same floor and door that we're using for our own kids. So I used to tell teachers, if you don't feel good about what you're teaching, and, or you want to benchmark it against something, you tell me whether you would want your child sitting in your school at any point. And so what the standards allow us to do is to be able to say, allowed me to be able to say, where are we on that trajectory? And so what we see when we look at that is that actually one in four, right, so this slide is saying that literally out of every four high school students we see, one of them, when they're graduating with the degrees, right, that I celebrated as a chief academic officer, one out of four of them are still reading at a below basic level, right? What the NAEP is showing is that actually, when we're looking at math and we talk about high-tech jobs, right, and my dad was a chemist, right, back before really there was this focus on STEM. And we know, he knows, right, that math is fundamental to that and we talk about the explosion in the tech industry. Well, right now, we have only one in 10 black, native, or Latino students who are ready for that. So as we move through, what we're seeing continually is that the standard we thought we had, the standard that we thought was good enough to get us there, really isn't the standard that we needed. And so the reason why the Illinois learning standards are important, the reason why so many people are saying the standards need to change is not because they're a panacea, but because they give us a benchmark of where we need to be. They give us the benchmark of knowing that in my kid's school, in our zip code, in our neighborhood, 
the standard is, is the target is exactly what it needs to be across town. So as we move through, and one of the things that we're seeing is this mismatch, and you're seeing it, as you can see here, right, between your Illinois assessment of student proficiency and what we know, at least through NAEP, that we can predict is coming. So when people say, and you all know, as educators in other states know, that often what we were assessing before wasn't really the target. And so now that we're shifting the target, we've all got to get used to the fact that, ooh, ooh, what we thought was proficient actually wasn't. And it's going to take us some time to get there, but we need to not change the target just because it gets hard. The other piece we know, and this is um, the math, the other piece we know, and this is just running through, again, some of your Illinois data, and I will just tell you, I could map up, it's not just there's something up with Illinois, just about every state, right, that is making the courageous shift to up their standards is, go is going to experience similar drops. So this is not an Illinois issue, this is a national issue. This is not something kind of wrong with Illinois kids right, or Illinois teachers, this is something we're all going to have to get used to. And, but if we interpret it in a way that we're shifting the ground, we're riding the playing field, what we were looking at before wasn't telling us the real story, that helps or should help us to realize that the shift is necessary, but it's going to take some time to get there. Now, when we look at why assessments? And I, people tell me, right, all the time, Sonia, look, and to be frank, a lot of teachers that I speak to actually don't have real issues with a lot of the new standards, be it Common Core, be it Illinois Learning Standards. It's not the standards, but they're worried about the assessments. Why do we need these assessments? Can't the assessments, can't we just kind of let people go and not, you know, not have these looming assessments? Well, one of the things that we know when we looked at that data is that actually the assessments we had weren't testing, weren't giving us the information we needed, right, about where kids were according to this new standard. And so what happens when you actually look at the assessments is they're asking very different questions than even the assessments I took when I was in fourth grade, eighth grade, or twelfth grade. And so just as an example, this is a sample grade four reading item. So when people ask me, why do we need to change the tests, right? It doesn't need to be PARC. Why does it need to be PARC? This is a real example. So this formally was a grade four reading item. And if I'm completely honest, this looked like the kind of question when I entered Baltimore City, the kids were being asked. And when I read the data and they told me, 75% of the kids in Baltimore City are proficient readers. This was the kind of question they were answering. That's not a bad question, right? But it's fairly general. What's the theme? You've got four choices, bubble it. Let me show you the difference with PARC. What you'll see in terms of the difference is that now students actually have to relate, right, what's happening in one paragraph and why that's actually important to the overall theme or message of the story. The second piece you'll see is that kids actually have to be able to surface evidence, right, from the text. Now, how many former or present lawyers do we have in the audience? If you, if you are in, in touch with the legal system in any way, shape, or form, go ahead. I know people are like this. I don't want to admit it, right? You and everybody else who's laughing knows that the ability to be able to read, to be able to go back into what you're reading and then defend it with the evidence from what you're reading is essential to what we would call professional skills. So part of what Park is setting us up to do is to say, how do we ask different questions of kids? Not that everything we know about what a young person can do is going to show up on a test. And any educator worth their weight in salt would never say that everything we need to know about kids is in any test. But what we do know is that the kinds of questions we ask 
This is from grade seven. The kinds of questions we ask change what our expectations of, of, are of kids. The kinds of questions we ask signal to kids what we think they are capable of. It does not mean that we expect them all to get there immediately tomorrow, but it does communicate to them what we think of their capabilities. So when I would walk into classrooms and high school students would tell me, oh, I, you know, they're just, they're just asking me to fill in some crossword puzzle. They knew immediately, based on what they were asked to do, what we thought their capability was. But when we asked them to do something harder, when we asked them to actually compare across books, across elements that they've read, which you can see here, right? It's not just, what do you think? Write me a story. And I love the uh, former middle school teacher. We all used to give the assignments. What would you do about school uniforms? Are you for them? Are you against them? Nothing wrong with the prompt. Everybody loves to reflect on school uniforms. But when we get down to the bottom line, I think everybody would admit young people actually having to read three different titles and then come together and form an argument is far closer to what everyone in this room, including myself, would expect their own middle school student to do. And that's the bottom line. That if I am honest, if we are all honest, I expect my three daughters to be able to answer this kind of question in middle school. And anyone who is only expecting them to answer this would have to answer to me. So the question then becomes, are we willing to hold the ground on what we know is the standard we would have for our own children? And how do we use PARC, not as the final end all to be all, but how do we use PARC to help us get there?